Okay, and then so when you when you started to um, interact with your with your parishes, whether it was in uh, Martinsville and Rocky Mount or up here in Roanoke, you started doing this blog. Okay, mm-hmm. and you're you're very prolific because my understanding is you put every homily out there, and then in between uh, uh, gospels, you know, from the from the mass on Sunday, uh, you 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 tend to kind of look at current events and things that are affecting the church, uh, different policies and things that are in the culture and that kind of thing. And you comment on them. So you've been doing that for a long time. So do you know, do you remember when you started the blog? Uh, in, uh, end of August, 2008. Okay. Now yeah. you, you said that you had, uh, you were trained, uh, in the English department of the, of the, colleges and you write beautifully you're absolutely right beautifully have you written any books or anything like that or is most of your is most of your writing because i want to read it because it's got to be interesting but uh, has most of your writing been through the blog it, it has yeah it has okay and what's what was the purpose when you first started that i'm guessing that there weren't a lot of priests that were out there blogging or is that i mean was that pretty common back in in 2009 yeah. 2010 it, it wasn't all that common back in those days. It was just starting out. I wasn't the first priest to have a blog by any means, but the whole thing was just starting. I mean, the short answer is people would ask me for copies of my homilies as they were leaving uh, okay. church pretty often. And, I, right. and then I thought the easiest way to deal with that would be to have them available online. I wouldn't have to run to the Xerox machine all the time, which is right. what I was having to do. So that, that right. was the initial impetus for it. Right. I would probably be one of those people because – because it it hits you one way when you hear it verbally, and then you want to go and say, oh, am I remembering that correctly? And you want to go read the written word, which is, right. and like I said, you write beautifully. You're you're yeah, you're an amazing yeah. writer, and and you obviously yeah. put an awful lot of thought into your homilies. Because now, do you write every homily and then and then recite it from the pulpit? Uh, I do. Yeah, I, I, I'm much much more at ease when I have the whole thing written out ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I experienced at St. Andrews. Okay, so we get to the point where where that's that's tumbling along and everybody seems to be happy with what Father Mark is writing on the blog uh, until um, June of June or July of 2018, and that's when the public disclo- disclosure about McCarrick's um, misdeeds and then also his his um, I. I don't think he's been removed from the church. Defrocked. I mean, what was the what was uh, Pope Francis's uh, declaration? He was supposed to go in in some unknown place and do his penance, uh, but not not. He's not a priest anymore. Is that true, or is he still a priest? Uh, he's not. He was removed from the priesthood. Yeah, in February of 2019. He, okay. He yeah. Okay, but there was a, some kind of public declo- disclosure in the summer. That right. Okay. Right. He, and, then, and then tell me a little bit about about what that's all about. And then and then in your blog, you have two names of two people that were young at the time that are now that are now adults, uh, Mike mm-hmm. and James. So if you could just give mm-hmm. me just give me a couple minutes about what what was disclosed uh, about um, Cardinal McCarrick. Sure. Yeah. On, on June 20th, 2018, the Archdiocese of, of Washington, New York and Newark and the Diocese of Metuchen, New Jersey, where McCarrick had been a bishop, all made an announcement announcing that McCarrick, that a judgment had been made, that accusations that he had abused a minor were found credible, uh, which in the, in the way the church operates these days is... Um, the way the, the the statement that is made, you know, that that uh, pu- what is acknowledged publicly is that there has been a credible allegation against somebody, and that that leads to a suspension of uh, whoever is credibly accused is suspended from ministry. Um, so they announced all, they announced that on June twentieth, uh, and also as part of that announcement, disclosed that settlements had been made regarding um, sexual relations with adults. At some time in the past, very cryptic uh, disclosure of of something that was pretty explosive thing to admit. Uh, then, not long and after, from, and that was from two thousand and two thousand and four. 
it, it, we, yeah, we later learned. I mean, at first right, it wasn't right. even acknowledged exactly. Right. That was happened. that was revealed in 2018 or whatever that there was some some situations where there was money passed to people that may have had relationships with uh, uh, Cardinal McCarrick, and the and the church paid them off basically. Exactly. Gave them settlements to be quiet, right. I guess. Right. Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Right, and that and that they had been. I mean, the the way that the the, the archdiocese and the diocese announced it, it, it was pretty. It, it it could have been interpreted either way. It could have been interpreted as consensual, uh, inappropriate relationships. But as as we learned, it's far from that. I mean, it was it was sexual abuse of of adults, seminarians, or young priests, but who were were under the under McCarrick's authority in such a way that they couldn't consent. I mean, it was certainly abusive uh, it was sexual right. abuse uh, albeit not of a minor right uh, anyway as the summer unfolded i mean the what was behind that announcement became clearer and clearer that james who later revealed his last name is grind uh who mccarrick turns out abused from age 11 onward for well over a decade uh, told his story, the New York Times got it out there about how just how craven the way McCarrick would, took advantage of him, what really was, and it also became clear that the 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 accusation made against him that had produced this effect of his is being suspended from public ministry um, was it was in the context of one of these reconciliation programs uh, that the Archdiocese of New York had been running. Um, so e even that, it, the, the, the cover, basically the cover up of McCarrick's wrongs ended because the prelates running the whole thing lost control of the situation because the, the, this fellow, Mike, whose story was told in the New York Times along with James, had told these lawyers in New York what had happened, who themselves were not bound by the same kind of cult of secrecy about this. And that's how it got well, out. He was, he, was, he was approached by the state of New York, right? Because they had gotten some information from the diocesan files that, um, that would have implica implicated McCarrick. Wasn't that, wasn't that the way Mike got, got connected to this whole yeah. thing? Yeah, I don't know how it wasn't I mean, the church. It wasn't the church that came to him and said, "We have we have reason to believe that you were abused." Right. It was it, it, was, it was a it, civil authority. Well, it kind of in between. It was this reconciliation program that was set up by the RCA. Oh, okay. I got you. That was okay. run independently by these two lawyers. Um, okay. And and I'm not sure if there, there there were two phases of that program, and I think to this day I don't think we know for a fact whether Mike was in phase one or phase two, whether he was, because they did, they did go through the files and did try to contact people who had, had, had reported um, abuse prior to that time and had never right. been followed up on. But then they also opened it up to anybody in the archdiocese who had been abused, who had never reported it. They, they had a chance also to go to the, to the, the, the lawyers on the reconciliation commission and tell their story and, I think he was in that latter category, actually. I think he, I don't okay. think he ever reported it before. Um, okay. And, and from, and from your, your blog, my understanding is that McCarrick actually baptized James. Correct. And then um, abused him because he was a family friend or something. So he, he was, he was connected with that family until the abuse started when James was 11. Correct. Right, okay. and, it, and it was the first baptism that McCarrick ever did. When he, when oh, he was really? Oh my gosh, years. I didn't know that. So that was the first baptism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So, I'm sure that had to have hit you harder than that just hit me. Right. Well, because yeah, you yeah. were because you were ordained by this man. Right. That you trusted. Even right. though you had even though that there were suspicions whirling around, you guys trusted this person. Right. Because right. of his position and because of the um I guess the tenets of mercy and forgiveness of the church, which I think I probably would have been right there with you. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, so giving that to people. 
So where, so how did that hit you? What, what did you, what was your first thought about what you had to do about that other than just process it yourself and say, this person went from, from doing his first baptism to a person that he abused to rising all the, all the way up to Cardinal in the church. Um, what was the how, what was the thought process? How do you even process any of that? 